I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you that you are amazing and you love us so much more than anyone ever could. You don't just love, you are love. And we just enter into that not because we think we deserve it today, but because you are worthy of our whole life since you, you died and paid for it. So we just come to you just as we are and ask that you just have your way with this message here and in the other room. Lord, reveal your word to us, Lord. Help us to get to know you more about who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. You see, we're blessed by God. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Back there. We're blessed. Our title is this, blessed, living in or receiving from. Uh, because I believe the whole world, to some degree, well, everyone in the whole world is blessed by God. Some people are living in it, and some people are living, receiving from it. And God's art calling us today to not just see him as someone that we receive from, like a parcel in the mail, or something that gets thrown to us every now and then, but someone that we live in. We're continuing on with Acts chapter 12 that I've started uh, continue on a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, the last message is on the start. I'm going to read the first uh, couple of verses from Acts 12, not 1 to 19, even though I've put it there, uh, just to get some context. And it, it says this It was about this time the King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with the approval amongst the Jews. He proceeded to seize Peter also. So you can see what is starting to happen. I talked about uh, that, that time, the Tower of Babel versus the, the Kingdom of God, I think it was. Um, and how we're living in a time of momentum toward almost like a Tower of Babel type of experience. The Tower of Babel was formed up in rebellion against God. The, the people were unified around, I don't know what. They had the same language, they built this tower, and in their minds they felt like they could finish this tower, then they were accomplished, and that they, they'd made it. But God didn't like that. And he shut it down, confused their language, and they split up. And here we see King Herod, and we see like little towers of Babel almost rise up all the time. People unifying in opposition against God. And over and over again throughout humanity, there comes a point where God says, that's enough. After the Tower of Babel came the flood, where only Noah and his family were connecting with God and righteous in God's eyes. And he, and he just saw the wickedness and rebellion. He said, that's enough. And the whole world flooded. He said he wouldn't do that again. And over and over again, the enemy is trying to rally people together in opposition toward God. And it's happening in this time and season too, where things that are clearly ungodly, not helpful, things that don't make sense, where we promote absolute confusion and abuse amongst our children, and, and we're all telling each other that that's actually really good. This, this absolute nonsense is coming out of intellectual brains Nonsense, foolishness is coming out of their mouths and ideas. It's just ridiculous. Yet there's a unity that's forming around this wicked ideology that's taking our Western world at the moment. Another Tower of Babel experience. And Herod was getting bold. He was getting emboldened in his wickedness because people were unifying around it and he was pleasing people. He killed James and that was like a really cool thing to do. It met with a lot of approval. So he thought, I'm going to Peter too. But God wasn't quite finished with Peter. And as we read, uh, as we learned the other week, he was miraculously released out of prison. The church at that point had seen what happens, what the story was. Herod goes after someone, he puts them in chains, he's going to kill them. Did it once, all they know is that it's going to happen again. And all they can do is hang out together in a house without any practical way out and go, God help. 
They met together and all they had left was prayer. And in that place where their only line of hope was in nothing practical but only in God, did God then step in and take control of the situation. You see, I, I mentioned that God is, is, seems to love it when we don't have multiple avenues of security and ways out. Sometimes he just seems to love it when we realise that he is the only hope and the only way out. And we, when we find ourselves in that place, he steps in and takes control. You see, in our society, we've got many ways out in many parts of our lives. We've got so many uh, medical avenues and we've got so many financial aid. We've got welfare coming out of just everywhere. People paying a lot of tax. Thank you for those that are uh, they're helping my family tax benefit. Thank you. To those that are doing that. We've got so many avenues to hold on to as far as security is concerned that sometimes what we lose as Australian Christians is that at the end of our life, the only thing that still stands is that one line, that one hope that's found in Jesus Christ. When we die, it doesn't matter what was left in our super. It doesn't matter what our retirement plan was. It all comes to an end and there's only one thing that still stands. The other things are things that you can put on top of the rock of Jesus Christ. But when our life comes crashing down, the main the thing that's the most important thing is, is Jesus there? And the church back in then only had that. They were in such intense times of persecution that all their options of security was gone. They were ostracised out of families. They met together in community. They didn't have trouble working out whether they were going to turn up to church that day. That's the only community that they were allowed in. So don't worry about persecution or anything like that or where things are going. Actually, beautiful things are coming out of it. And so we continue to read on. Uh, from the end of verse 19. Herod's on his on his way up, leading the new I call Tower of Babel experience. And it says, Then Herod went from Judea to be saved is if we repent, yes. not if we slot in and line our life up to be a little bit more Christian like. May one day Christian values not be what people think in their knowledge of good and evil as positive things. May Christian values be radical ways of living that nobody else would, would ever live unless God came into their heart. <laughs> but the question that comes up in my mind when I read this this chapter. James killed. Peter miraculously set free. Herod killed. To me, it just seems way too easy for God to step in and get involved. And I get confused why he doesn't get involved when I think clearly he should. Does anyone ever think that? Sorry, God. Help me in this process. So I'm trying to think about this. Because do you want to get to know God more? Yes. No, I do. I want to get to know Him more. So if something's confusing me, I'm missing something in who He is, in His nature. Why, why, why do you do great miracles here and then, and then you just let things go here? Like, it's so easy for you, God. I was talking uh, to Mum this week about a little bit like this and we talked about, well, what about John the Baptist? Why did he have to have his head chopped off? I mean, seriously. He was awesome. Jesus said he was the best guy that's ever been born of a woman. I don't know any other type of guy, but anyway, there's a lot of those type of guys. And he was the best of them. Why did he have to get some young girl to dance around and have his head chopped off with a sword? I mean, that's not a good way to go. And it's not like Jesus was very happy about it either. He was really sad. He went away by himself, like, really upset about that. And that's Jesus. The heart of God. You know, the more I look at this, the more I realise 
when I look at the nature of God, is that more uh, that this world that we live in and our life in this time is much less significant than we realise. And then when I allow my mind to open up, my heart to open up that, a flood of scriptures start backing it up. If you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. You want to hold on to this world, well, you're going to lose it. All these things about the kingdom of God mindset is all about releasing yourself from the attachment of the world and holding on to your eternal uh, connection, which is God, the eternal Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I think God wants us to hold less and less onto this world and more and more tightly on to Him. Where's that clip you got me, Lee? I keep losing it. That's right. More and more unto God, less and less unto the world. You know, I know I refer to this parable a lot. The parable of the seed that gets thrown out. And I refer to this one a lot because it just makes sense to me. The seed that grows up and thorns and everything are growing up with it and it ends up choking the plant. The plant stays alive but it's choked up. And then Jesus reveals what all these things it's being choked up with. Worries. Worries of life. Every attachment to the world is what grows up to choke that seed, that good seed. Nothing wrong with the seed. Nothing wrong with the plant. Everything wrong with the stuff growing around it. And that's the attachment to the world. The deceptfulness of wealth and all this stuff, man. That we get so caught up in easily. And when I was looking at this scripture, I thought, you know, those thorns are like the other things that we hold on to in hope. We hold on to our money, like that's our security. Like, Lord, don't ever ask me to give too much away. Like, oh, that's I'm holding on. That's an issue in your heart if you have an issue, like think about that. Uh, You're worried about this, you're worried about that, you're worried about how people think about you. All these things you're holding on to. And you think internally that they're things that are actually keeping you safe but they're actually killing you and making you completely unfruitful you see God has desired us to live a life that's fruitful this year I I believe God wants us to be scattering seed you don't have any seed without any fruit to grow and just throw out seed everywhere we go but if we are very attached to the world the worries of the world we're overcome with you know, the, the mindset of living by money or anything like that, we're holding on. We, we've got no seed to scatter around. Or if we do try and force things out, it comes with the spirit of the world. You know, I don't know if you've noticed, but you can actually say truths about God, but it can sound terrible because it's with the spirit that it comes through. The Pharisees knew the word. They knew the law. They were able to recite it, but they didn't have the spirit by which it was written in. They brought their own spirit with it and it became like death and a controlling noose around the people that they're doing. They go, you travel, Jesus said, you go around the world to get a comfort. And when you finally get them to be a comfort, they become twice the son of hell than you are. The word is good. But if you're proclaiming the word and trying to live for Jesus while deeply attached to the world, it's going to come with the spirit of the world. Where God wants us to have the spirit of truth. He wants us the Holy Spirit to be filling us so that we are fruitful people, alive people, that when our mate gets his head chopped off, we're able to overcome it in Jesus' name and keep going because we're so detached from the world. Don't you have to go to funerals where people... Probably not... But it's, there's a joyful element when you know where the person's going. It's like, oh, wow, you just got rid of all this rubbish that we're still living in. You, lucky thing you. How dare you leave me behind here? You have this awesome time up there. In those moments, you realise that our attachment to the world is really a binding. Abraham. 
received a blessing from God. And that blessing from God could have choked him or could have released him in a moment of the decision that was presented to him when God asked him to sacrifice his son, to kill his son. You know, the blessing that God is giving you, your kids, like I know a family, like, we prayed for them that had these issues of miscarriage over and over again. Brooke and I came we prayed for them. Nine months later, they had a baby, never seen them again. They're holding <laughs> on so tightly to their child. Where that child was a gift. Yes. Is it Isaac? <laughs> yeah. Abraham and Isaac. Isaac was a gift. That could have been Abraham's chokehold if he wasn't going to continue to trust God in it. Your gift can become your stronghold. It can come from a good place. It can come from God. But it can become your stronghold. And God wanted to set up something. And, and Abraham actually obeyed God and trusted in God when it made no sense at all. When Peter was released from prison, they couldn't make sense of how the solution could have unfolded. That's why when he turned up, Rhoda, the servant girl, was like, Oh, couldn't, didn't open the door, was like, and no one believed it, that it was Peter. No one could have thought or imagined that that could have happened. God says he would do more than we could ever ask or imagine. He's pretty clever, pretty creative. We know that in our head, but sometimes in the practical day-to-day -day life, it's a much more of a struggle. And I'm in that boat too. Right? What about Job? <laughs> what about Job? It, it, it's really revealing in Job God's heart for people. And you're thinking, how is that? That's really mean. But this is, this is I'm going to read from, it says there, that, then the Lord said to Satan, just a casual chat, hey Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hand. So the flocks and the herds are spread throughout the land. Sometimes I skip over that bit. I've never really reflected on that. Satan's like, come on God, I know what you've done for him. You just keep blessing him. You keep protecting him, you keep covering him, you keep making his life great and all this cool stuff happening. Stop right now and think, this is actually the heart of God for us. That we would flourish, that we would be safe, that everything we did would just be blessed everywhere. That's God's heart for you, that's God's heart for me. That's what he wants. And Satan is so frustrated he couldn't get in. You know what, Satan is pretty frustrated about you too because he just can't get in. How many times has God protected you? Yes. How many times has God blessed you? Over and over again. And we need to stop and go, thank you, God. Yes. You are wonderful. You're grateful. The daily verse for today is this. Just then, as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built it built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We need to realise what we have. When we don't realise what we have, we start becoming a little bit like the lost son who thinks it's all good out there, and you've got nothing good going for you. But anyway, we see the heart of God here over Job. But you know what? God does have a passion and a desire to bless us, to protect us. That's his passion and desire. But it's not his primary desire and concern. His primary concern for your life and my life is that we hold true to what's the most important. That we look for eternity. If we get so blessed and caught up with the blessings, very easily, like the Israelite people, over and over again, we can turn God's blessings into our own curses. Yeah. And we can start holding on to the world and every little thing that comes through the world, even if it comes from a good intention, and it can destroy us. 
God's primary concern for us is that we are safe in him. Not just for this time, little time on earth, but for all of eternity. He died so that he could have a relationship with you and me, not just for a few years, but for all eternity. He knows what we're going to. We see now like with a bad mirror. I don't know what mirrors were like back then. They're pretty good these days. But anyway, he was, it wasn't a good mirror. Like we sort of see it, but we don't. We sort of see it. God sees it crystal clear. He knows what's going on and on and on and on and on for all eternity. And he wants us to enter in that place with him and grow our relationship with him on earth and for all eternity. He didn't come to bless us so that we could become selfish and full of pride as he knows is in our heart. That's why he died for us, but to set us free. And the awesome thing about Job was, it was all the blessings were stripped apart. And you think, why God? But the thing is, God's not all about this life on earth. It's temporary. It's passing. It's coming and going. You know, and things don't make sense. But there's the real stuff's coming. I think some of our problem as, as Christians in the Western world is that we're so focused on this life. And then we live so much for this life. We end up not having a life on this earth or much into eternity. Because God knows we're not going to find life. What we're doing is be on antidepressants. <laughs> when we zone in on our life. You know? And when all that was stripped away from Job, and, and all Job had left was what? His hope in God. That's all he had left. So what God saw in his heart remained. And after that horrible time, <laughs> the blessings just were lavished on him. God held himself back for a while. It wasn't like God inflicting him. He just removed his blessing from him that he loved to pour all over him. He just removed himself a little bit. Boom! Life was disastrous very quickly. And then when the time was over, he poured it back all over in more and more abundance. We don't understand how blessed we are in God. We need to be thankful for that. You know, the parable of the, the lost son is a, a good... It, it just reveals so much of the heart of God too. You've got the young son who, unlike Job, was living in absolute blessing but couldn't see it. Could only see what maybe he could have been, the enticingness of the world. You know, grips my heart too at times. And he just went with that. But you know, that father was a rich dude with lots of connections. And when he, he could have found out very easily by sending messengers out, all sorts of things to find out where his son was at. I mean, he deeply cared for his son. He, it's the analogy of God the Father in his heart. He could have sent out messages. He could have found out exactly where he was. He could have sent out money to support him, to make sure he was looked after because he cared so deeply with him. But he knew that that wasn't the solution. He didn't want to just throw out band-aid solutions for us. Just barely survive. He knew that the answer for his lost son was not to be separated from his house, but to come in his house. He doesn't want us to be at the outside of his house. He wants us to come in his house and come under his blessing. The other sad bit of that story was the other son was working hard and, and he also struggled to see how blessed he was. And his father's like, you've got it all. You're blessed. Let's not be like that son either. So we, we are blessed. And God is wanting us to come in his house. In him. Not to be sent blessings from afar. God's desire is for us to be in his house. Under his care, being blessed as his heart's desire is, and to go forward in that. Sometimes we look at God and think he's mean when he steps back a little bit for our own good. God will work everything 
for good for those that love him. And there's some awful stuff that can happen in our, in our life. But the most important thing, whatever you're going through, I've gone through some stuff too in my life. You've gone through some stuff in your life. The most important thing for us to do is to hold on to the only thing that's going to last for all of eternity. All of eternity. We're all passing through. We're just passing through. We're children of life. And these disciples, you know, they had persecution after persecution, but they had so much happening. There's so many things going on. Because they were just holding on. They experienced the truth. They held on to it. And things happened. I'm going to pray. Lord, first of all, we want to say thank you for this country that you have blessed us with to live in. We thank you that we are naturally safe, that we have food, we have shelter, we don't have really much to worry about, yet we seem to worry a lot. And we're sorry for that. Help us to come into your house and be blessed living in you, not living apart from you. I pray, Lord, if there are things that uh, any of us in here are holding on to that are actually choking us, just reveal that by your Spirit right now. pray that you would overcome our fears with incredible boldness in the way that we live our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. If you need any prayer for anything, if God's like to hit you with something you need someone to stand with, pray with, I'll be here for a little bit to pray. Pretty sobering message, is it? I'll make sure I don't listen to it later. I don't too much to deal with that. But it's good to come to that place, isn't it, of like, ooh, okay, this is what's really going on. So that we can get out of this rut that we're in, that we didn't know we were quite in because we thought it was something else, and walk into freedom in who you were always created to be. Living on the edge, living with purpose, living as a child of light. God believes in you so much. He believes in us so much. I know it's crazy, but he does. He's trusted his whole message to us. <laughs> message are new every morning. Thank goodness for that, eh? Be blessed, guys. There is so much hope. Amen.